do like, important things. So the things I want you to kind of get out of this is that if you want to, you can do a start. I highly recommend it. Startups are really cool. You can work on the tech that you want to, and hopefully you can make some money someday, but the experience is fantastic as well. Um, there are a few simple things that we kind of need to learn, and they are very simple. Um, there are things that I didn't know, but kind of talk and some simple to see if you have any good ideas, if you actually have a business idea. And besides, you work for a company, so this kind of stuff, even though if you don't even start a startup, the stuff you should know about the company that you're in, see if it's going somewhere and whatnot. Okay? So, why should you listen to me? Uh, because um, my vast experience with this single startup that isn't even done. Okay? So, I'm just kind of, I'm going to share kind of some of the details of what we have done that we found successful and what we haven't. Hopefully this will be of help, okay? So the first thing to know is that ideas for businesses, or any ideas, are really cheap. Okay, so in Structure, is my startup, and um, we do software for education. So when you take a class at a university, say you're training assignments, let's say you course content, message your teacher. I think everyone in this room who has used that software at school thought, this is awesome, I can do better over a weekend, am I right? See, so this is not a new idea. Everyone had it, so it's, it's nothing to keep secret or anything. And you'll find out that this is the case with all business ideas. There's really nothing secret about the idea itself. It's actually the execution of the idea and getting the right people involved behind it. Okay? So, uh, kind of the first... How I kind of got started is that I wanted to do a start. I think you do a start for two different reasons. You can do it, one is to change the world. The second one is to make money. Hopefully you can do both of them. And so, I was uh, in grad school, and I took an entrepreneurship class, because I was trying to decide what I was going to do with my life, if I was going to go work for a big company, um, you know, I wanted to work in Ruby, um, and I wanted to do something interesting and to change the world, right? And so, I came to this, I took a course uh, with my co-founder, and all of the ideas that we brought to the course, as soon as we learned how to kind of evaluate them, they just got shot out of the sky really easily. So the first one that kind of really she said, all ideas now is the big question is, how big is your market? Okay? And essentially, all this is saying is how much money is being spent on what you want to build. And you actually need to find out this number. Okay? And the number might not exist, but you need to do some type of research to come up with one that you can justify and defend. In our case, it was very simple because the main competitors in our market were public companies. They have to divulge how much money they make. And so it was very simple to say, okay, person has 50% of the market, they make this much revenue, this is how much people are spending in our market, very simple. Okay? And, um, and so a lot of the ideas that we had were just, they were just too small. There's nothing we could do with them. And so we followed the advice of uh, Paul Graham. Paul Graham uh, gives a lot of good advice, and the one that we took was he said, uh, if you're a technologist, you know how to code, you know how to build technology, and you just think of the stuff, the software that you use, and there's probably a business idea there. Okay? Now there's one caveat, you've got to remember that you're pretty weird. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so a lot of areas are like, oh, here's this cool plugin to, yeah, like, uh, like developer plugins, or yeah, you need to think of ideas that are painful to you that you can use that normal people use too. Okay? Alright? And then depending on those, then you look at the size of the market, and then you can kind of look at the, the two main paths that you can take with startups. Okay? So what I'm about to call uh, a lifestyle business, or the other one is a venture startup. Okay? Now, I'm a big fan of the recent signals, and I like what they're doing and stuff, and essentially a lot of their advice is to say, build a lifestyle route. So it's a great route, and you can do really well, and then venture capitalists are kind of saying, oh, it's a good route. Okay? So the difference is, is, a lifestyle business is a business that can make a decent amount of money, um, and it's going to be something that's going to support the lifestyle that you want to live. You know, the time off, the time with your family, the vacationing, and whatnot. So it's kind of a lifestyle business. Now, a venture startup is the one that's going to change the world. It's going to take a lot of resources to do that. Okay? So the venture way is a lot more risk, a lot more money, you lose a lot of control, um, but the payout could be bigger. It's a bigger potential. And so I have nothing against lifestyle businesses. Um, I think they're cool. Um, I just couldn't think of an idea that school for lifestyle business, the one I came up with was more in the venture, in the venture line. Okay? It was one that, like, uh, like we said, signal suggests that you should, uh, you should fail on the side, right? You know, you have your normal day job and then at night you go to another company. I think it's really cool, and you can't. There's 
some ideas that that's not suitable for. You need to be full time with you know a team for like a year in order to have a product that's going to do that much to grow. Okay. And so in order to do that, well, you have to have money to last you for a year, which is high risk, but potentially a higher reward. Okay. And so uh, okay, so what we did is that. Okay, so you got to, whatever your idea is, is you have to find out how big is the potential of it. And depending on how big it is, then you kind of go these two routes. Now, even though you go to the lifestyle business, um, well, we went the venture startup route, but the same things that are valid for a venture startup or the questions that investors will ask, is that you should be asking yourself in the lifestyle business too. So even if you're not going to have an investor, just pretend that her name is Ashley, and pretend in your mind what questions she would ask. <laughs> Alright, so a couple of things is that you need to know if you're ready now, you got a market that's big enough. I'm gonna repeat this thing. Rule of thumb, if your market, you say all the money spent in one year is less than a billion dollars, that's a lifestyle business. And that's one that is probably not suitable for a venture startup because these things are not going to be interested because there's not enough payoff possible in it. But if you have an idea where people are spending more than a billion dollars, you know, like a billion to a billion and a half, which is like where our startup is, then that's that's right on the on the cusp of venture startup and something bigger for it. Okay, so that's kind of the rule of thumb. If it's the market is under a billion dollars, it's probably a lifestyle business. So you can still make really good money with a lifestyle business. It's just not enough to pay out for investors to sink a lot of money into it. Okay? And so we picked the venture way, and then you, and then you gotta do your research, right? And our product validation. So you need to know who are the competitors, right? And why aren't they adequate? What's the pain in here? So pain is an opportunity. And then you need to know if you're building the right solution for the product that you're after. So in ours, you know, we were students. Um, it was, you know, as a student I knew, but it was, it was just terrible, right, the software. I thought, oh, I, we can do better than this, no problem. And then the advice was, well, no, because students aren't going to buy the software. It's the school. So you need to know what schools need, right? You actually know what you're building is actually solving a problem, or you need to fill a problem at all. And you need to know if what you're building is the right thing, because it doesn't matter how good your development team is, if you're building the wrong product, you'll never succeed as a company. And so, and ours was fairly simple because uh, we were going to sell to universities. And so we needed to validate our product. So what we did is we just went to Google. We started finding all of these schools that we could go to where we had like family where we could you know, sleep on the couch for free. Okay, so we just identified this and we're going to go on a road trip. That's how we're going to do our product validation. Okay? We went to a conference where we the beginnings. No one's ever seen this picture before. But uh, that awesome logo, an awesome sign up there, that was our booth. And then gas was super expensive, like it is right now. And so we borrowed my brother Geo Metro. <laughs> and we headed out on the road, and we hit like 130 degrees in base, and we couldn't keep up, and we sweated like 10 miles off. It was awesome. <laughs> but I'm going to show you what we, uh, a little piece of what we did with each of these clients to actually validate. Um, what we were building. So we would, we would come, we'd introduce ourselves, this is what we're trying to build, and we would just cold call people. We'd say, we're going to build the next great system, will you help us design it? Either that, or we just walk in, pretend that we had an appointment, and it worked really well. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and, so, uh, and so they say, sure. So then we come in, we say, okay, here's these pain points that other schools have expressed about their solution and this product. Now the first time, of course, we made these up. But we just made them sound reasonable. We said, there's another school says they're having this pain. We say, do you feel that pain too? And they say, no, I feel that pain every day. You know, I hate that. And then we say, well, what other pain do you feel that's not offering it? Oh, uh, actually, most of it's client side job and all the dependency of the app. It was terrible. Okay? And then we go on and say, well, right, now I'm going to show you some ideas. And so before we wrote any code, is that we mocked up our application in PowerPoint. So, and uh, the idea is that in PowerPoint we can get feedback from the, from, the, from the people about what they want in the product, and it's something more malleable than even code, more malleable than really just pressing. Okay. 
So I'm going to show you a couple of slides that we used to do this, okay? So Chris has our old logo and all this kind of fun stuff, okay? And then, we, and then uh, so this is what we mocked up in PowerPoint. And say, okay, now this is our scenario. I'm going to create a course. I would click here to take you to the screen where I can manage my assignments. You know, if I click here, you know, I get this little box, right? So a lot of this was actually in, in the user interface. It was that we nailed what was the essence of the task that they were trying to do. This is how we assembled our shorties. Okay. And we just used the you know, user interface to define that from that. Okay. So are the essential elements on here? And uh, this was a little bit tough for us because we, uh, Michael Hunter, uh, his advisor is how I actually met these ability courses. And he said, well, you never ever um, give a, a screenshot to a potential client ever because instead of telling me what's wrong with the interaction, they'll argue with you about the, you know, this pixel should be over here or this gradient should be two pixels wider or something like that. Right? They get lost in the detail. At the same time, it's like we could go to someone saying, well, here's this sketch on the board and what's the next generation of learning management systems that you know, you're going to pay a million dollars for? Okay? So this was our kind of, you got to walk a lot of tight ropes. This, this is what we did. And so some people were confused. They thought this was an actual application. Um, that's true. So, so it just it had to be enough to say this thing could be real. We were shaking ourselves, of course, we could do with HTML and CSS. And then, um, you know, we, we made sure that we had the essence. That's what we're trying to get out from them. Like, well, actually, I don't, I don't care about that assignment, you know, types and whatnot. Okay? And so we kind of walked through there and kind of some scenarios. So we had something concrete to actually send our stories about. Okay? So we'd say, oh, I saw on my calendar, and we'd actually overlay all the calendars on top of each other. And if you wanted to reschedule an assignment, you can just, you know, drag them up. This is, these are all slides, one piece. That's how we do our animation. Okay? And uh, so it was like, oh, you drag it up to reschedule an assignment. Okay, now you think that's stupid, right? But um, you really don't know how much people are suffering because like, people would almost like stand up and tear up and give us an applause. <laughs> <laughs> it's because we're used to like, we pick good tools for us, but we're not like normal people. And people actually use terrible, terrible, terrible tools. And something like a, as simple as a drag and drop is, um, you know, so simple, uh, you know, and it's, it's not gratuitous, it's just intuitive. And, and it's something that they didn't even know it was possible to technology. It's ridiculous, okay? But that's good because that means that there's an opportunity there. So it's so simple and you don't even have to have an insanely great idea, you just have to be confident. And so what we did is that we, you know, we, that, we had that, that one scenario you kind of saw, we had a bunch of them, we had 381 slides, because it was down to the quick level like I showed you. And then from that, then we, we, I would present, and then Brian Wimmer, my co-founder who saw the pictures, he would just furiously type all the notes. So we took transcripts of everything that we had. So we could refer to them, like, well, what did that guy say? And you know, then you get confused after you go through meetings. But we also had that transcripts where I always go back to. And we go back and find out that we had forgotten something that was actually said that we missed during, during the conversation, right? And so you keep those transcripts. And the first time we did it, we went down to, to Vegas, uh, stayed with my sister, and we met with a couple of schools. And, you know, no one was like, you guys are awesome. They're like, well, you got some good ideas, and, but, you know, you don't know this and you don't know that. And then we came back and you know, we talked to our, our advisor at the time, and he read the notes, and we were really disappointed. We're like, well, I guess this is it. Our idea is done. Um, and he looked at it, and he, he read it, and there was good and bad in it. He says, you know, this, this right here, this is gold. And I remember being surprised at that. I'm like, well, why would you think it was gold? He said, because you have done the work, you know exactly what they need, and the pain that they're having, and you know all this information that no one else in the market knows. Right? And then we just iterated on the product. We took all that feedback, we incorporated it into our PowerPoint slide deck, and we, we did it again. Right? We just kept doing that over each school. We saw about 17 schools until our design didn't change anymore. Okay, so that's when we knew that the essence of what we're trying to build is the right thing. Okay? Now, the thing is, is that, um, you know, we say, is, is a real love. Right? Because I think there's a tendency to say, I bounce a, an idea off of somebody, like, well, that's an obvious thing. Good. That's obviously a good idea. Um, and yeah, you should do that. Okay? That, that's not far enough. Okay? Um, you have to press a little bit farther, but it's okay to be candid with people. So I figure I'll show you a few of the exercises that we had at the end. Let's say, would you pay for this? Point blank, would you pay for it? How much would you pay for this? Right? And then we asked them, of course, how they would pay because we were trying to figure out our business model, how we would charge them for it. And 
so you can ask, you know, would you pay for this? And, uh, sure, no or no. Or, I mean, but, but you know, it's not like, I think that they would buy, but they just ask. Because you got to know. Because right? you're going to spend the next four years of your life and how many hours, you know. And, uh, and you got to know. You can't just do it on a whim. You have to know that what you're doing is something that they would buy. Right? And it's okay to be bold and to just ask. Okay? Then we ask them other follow-up questions too. Like, uh, how to describe to a colleague. This is our, our gut check. Is, this is how we presented ourselves. How are you hearing it? How are you interpreting what we're presenting? Um, how would they describe it? And then also, just, you know, is this a base hit a double home run? Just to kind of gauge, you know, their excitement or not excitement, which is also very useful. Okay? And, uh, and this actually worked really well. I mean, people will be candid. I mean, you don't have to be pushy or crazy like that. If you're, if you're up front and honest with them, they'll be up front and honest with you back. Okay? And then you get insanely good information. And so, towards the end of our beginning, People say, actually, I want a triple. You know, because we can get it in there. And we've got a few home runs. Um, we got half a foul ball runs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but the, that was the information that we needed to know. Right? Was this person actually going to do it? And is our product key to the right people? Okay? okay, so after that, we, we knew that the product that we were building was something that people would buy. We knew that if we built this thing, so if we built it, would you buy it? If it existed today, that's going to have to explain that it's not over lap, you know, we're going to catch up and build it yet. This is before we wrote any code. So, all right? And so, at that point, you know, so you got to get to that point, right? So these are all crucial steps. You got to find out is there any money to be made? Are you actually going to build the right product? Are you going to make users happy with it? Right? So, uh, okay, so let's say that we've defined our market, let's say it's big enough. And you find some pain in the market. So when you're meeting with anybody, if they talk about pain, you're like, oh yeah, that's such a bother, and that takes me like two weeks. You know, anything that they mention about pain or something that sucks, then your alert should go off and say, that's a potential product or business idea or something that if I solve something would they need that. Okay? And then uh, let's say that we've already gone and validated the product, are you that? Okay? And the answer is absolutely not. Okay? We need to do a business model. Now, what the business model is, what you're trying to do is that you need to make a machine. Okay, a business is a machine in and of itself. So, in addition to its software, you got to, you know, the business has to say, okay, we have these customers, we have a way of getting them to be customers, and we can make money from them. You've got to make a machine. There's a bunch of different types of machines. If you're lucky, you can get the best machine, which is the instructor comp. <coughs> I showed, uh, we have this at our office now. We had a our designer, he actually built instructor on a start from himself. That's at our office, come by and check it out. And my wife said, I don't know if you need that other, your rear slide, because this proves it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, so the business model is a machine. And you have to create it, like, virtually before you actually going to implement it. Okay? So how you're going to do that is you're going to pull out Excel, and then you're going to do a ton of different models. You're going to have this wicked spreadsheet that includes everything. Okay? You're going to have people's salaries in it, how much they cost, like office space, how much their phone costs, how much their computer costs, right? And you're going to have, um, you know, how much does it cost for us to deliver our service and, and bandwidth and servers? And then you're going to say, okay, well we need two developers in in March. And then another three at the end of the summer. All right, you have to map all that out and see okay, how this go and how we're going to acquire customers. Okay, so this business model is tailored specifically to what you're thinking, right? So one, it could be like like ours is, a, is an enterprise sale, so it's a direct sale. We actually have to talk to every every customer. Right? But maybe another business idea would be it's a freemium model. So we're going to do some advertising. People are going to come use it for free. So you can model okay, how many people can we get to just sign up for free and what percentage of those are going to convert. Okay, and then you model that out and you actually put in your conversion rate in this big, fat spreadsheet. Okay? So I, I, I put in a picture of a spreadsheet. This is a, a super, super simple one that I just Googled up real quick. Uh, it needs to be a lot more sophisticated than this one. Okay, this one is just like oh, employee number one, employee two, and assumes a, a click-through rate and stuff. Okay? So you make this huge spreadsheet. If, this 
is where like if you have you know your brother-in-law who went to like business school and he has an MBA and you don't know what he's useful for or anything, this is what he can build for you. Okay. So okay. so you know you're gonna have like you know eight tabs on your spreadsheet and it takes hours to dig into this, but and then you and then you're gonna the best thing to do is you create one slide that actually links all the variables. Because what this is going to do is it's going to identify all the different knobs that actually makes your, your company go. Right? So if you're in a freemium model, you know, the obvious knobs you're going to have is what percentage of people coming to my site are going to sign up for the freemium and how many of those are going to convert. So that's like a little knob, so you just put it right there in your, your spreadsheet and you have all your graphs. And then as you tweak those numbers, you can see how it affects it. Okay? And so at this point, you look at this and you do the standard reports like revenue and gross margins and operating margins, and those, you know, just the simple things. And you can see, can I make that model that is, I need to make it reasonable, but it has to be able to make money. And if you can't get that to make money, then don't do the company. Okay? That's the kind of key there. If you can't make it work on the spreadsheet, it ain't going to work. So if you can make it work with reasonable assumptions in it, then that's the key. So, um, so this is the part, this is actually the crucial piece. So um, I was never once asked by any venture capitalist or any investor for a business plan, ever. What they wanted to know was they you go in and meet, you give a little presentation of who we are, what market are we in, what's the pain in our market, and how we're going to solve it, and we say, this is how we got it, this is how we know that the product we're going to build is going to satisfy, and here's our model that says that we can make money. And that's it. And then if they want to go further, and they're going to actually invest, this is the only thing that they want to look at, is your model, and say, send over your financial model, and send over a big fast spreadsheet. Okay? Now, uh, I did put our spreadsheet on these slides, uh, even though it would have been well and useful for you guys, um, because, your business model is your business. And so if someone has your business model, they can do your business. Okay? And so that, that's actually the essence of your, of your entire company is your financial business model. Okay? So you don't just give it to anybody. All right? Okay, so, and then I, I guess some other points up here. I had some misconceptions about investors as well when I started. I kind of had the feeling that an investor was this, you know, this totally rich dude and you had to like be penitent and come in and you have know, this, ah, oh, please give me money, you know, because you know, I hope this business is going to work out, but, you know. And I don't, I don't know why I thought that. Does anyone else think that way? I don't know. So it's not true at all. Okay? Uh, specifically, venture capitalists, how they, what they do is that they go out to other uh, really rich people, like uh, universities and um, huge funds, and they raise money from them. So like a, a, a good sized venture fund is like, they'll say, they'll, they'll go and raise a billion dollars. So if there all these other investors, these institutional investors, then okay, you give me a billion dollars and they have to invest, invest it into small companies, right? And then those companies are gonna grow and go public and make money and that's how they give the money that they make back to the people that they're making money for, okay? So actually an investor or a venture capitalist, it is their job to actually invest money in companies. And they're actively looking for good companies to put money in. Right? So it's not like, you know, you're not, you're doing them a favor. It's not, you know, they have to be usually leading them. They're actually looking to get, to invest money in good companies. Okay? And so, and that's true of other investors as well. Um, you know, even angel investors, you know, as wealthy individuals, they want to you know, put some money. But the term that they use is that I'm going to put my money to work. Because I'm just wanting to sit down, let's put it to work, let's get a, a good return off of it. Because if, if your startup is successful, then they're going to make a lot of money. Okay, so that's kind of, and so this is how you prove it to them, is how you're going to put their money to work, is when you, in your model. So you give me this much money, that's going to allow me to hire three people and a PR guy, and according to my model, if my conversion rate, if I get anywhere close to that, then you know, we're going to make this much money by next year. That's what the financial model should tell you. The other question is like, well, how much money should you raise? That's actually from your financial model too, is how much does it tell you you need to raise? Right? You just run it to say, I have no money right now, and you should go in the negative. And, uh, and say, how, how far do you go into the negative before we start making money? And that's the exact amount that you're going to actually need to raise. 
So actually, everything's driven off of that. All right? Okay, so there's a couple of different funding options. Uh, uh, so this is a good point, too. The top one there is loans and credit cards. Um, so you've got to be really careful with this, okay? So I don't uh, suggest that anyone go out and go to the startup and go get out a ton of loans. Um, is that you have to know that what you're doing is actually going to pay off. And if you haven't done all of the work and know the market better than anyone else, and you have a model that you can stand on, then do not get a loan. But if you do, then there's something like a small, some small amounts are okay. And of course, depends on how we talk about angels. Then you go to VC grant, and or there's even grants from the government that you can get to, if they want to encourage business and whatnot. Right? Or you can do it for other stuff. You can actually use the, the revenue to go off. Okay. So uh, I want to take some questions. Let's ask Mr. Structure Tom. So essentially, that's kind of some ideas. Uh, usually, get some questions. So what do you what do you guys want to talk about? Please. Two. How did you deal with there's two, I've been through, well, actually three startups. Okay. And there's, there's the objection of, okay, so give me your references, let's talk to them, we'll buy your stuff. Well, that's number one. Number two is, okay, you projected three years, you know, 6,000 man hours, and it ends up being, as usual, 25, 30,000 man hours. So, how do you deal, how did you deal with both of them? Okay, so the first one you said, how do you deal with, uh, was with a customer? Yes. If I get a customer and they wanted three references. Right? So, how we deal with that is that you build a kick butt bot. That's how you deal with that. Because you're going to find someone who's going to say, if I adopt your product, it's going to save me this much money, and it's going to save me this much time, and this much headache, and all this pain that I've experienced is going to go away, then you'll find someone that doesn't matter if you have a reference. And they're going to be willing to take the plunge, at least in part. And that's the only way that I know how to do it. Okay, and, and there are pretty few in part between. Yeah, but you got to find them. Because you know, those are the early adopters. And if you don't get those, then you won't get any adopters. And so, um, yeah, that, that's a good litmus test. If you can't get someone to do that, then you're not solving enough pain. And your product isn't focused enough. Okay. Yeah. And the second part was? The second part was development is always, you know, take the number, double it. <coughs> Okay, so the idea was is that your estimates are completely way off in your development and whatnot. Okay, I think that's uh, you know it, it goes back to the development methodology. It's like you know get the minimum viable product. And we actually put that as part of our kit. So we actually would list out these are our ideas. And here's a huge fat feature list, and we say, but well, we can't do that at first. And so we take them away. And like this is what we think that we can do within the next six months or three months. Is that good enough for you to buy? They say, no, I need that feature, I need that feature. And you're like, okay, here's $100, how would you allocate that across these features? And you find out which features are actually really important, which ones they have to have. Because that's how, that's how we kind of did it. You get the minimum viable product and you iterate like crazy. Do you see any pattern in how far in the future the investors want to see any return on investment before they were going to? Okay, the pattern of how long investors want to see? How far? It out in the future before they would see any return on their investments. Okay, so how far out of the future will you need to you know, ramp up for investors to make any money? Right? Well, before they were interested. Before in they were interested. Okay. Uh, for a venture person, is that you need to hit about um, 40 million in revenue for a year within about four or five years. <coughs> because that's the magic number is 40 million a year is when you can have a successful IPO. And IPO is where you know, the public can buy your shares and stock, and that's when everyone can get their money out, including the investors. And so if, if you can't be showing somewhere between you know, 8 to 12 million a quarter within a four, you know, four or five years, then that is not interesting for a venture capital. Right. They'd rather take more risk to get more payoff. Um, can you talk about, okay, uh, from the startups that I've done, I've seen, you know, where you ask people flat out, would you pay for this product? And I find people will almost always tell you yes, but that's not the case in my experience. Um, I, I've had products where people will tell me yes, and then they don't, and people, other cases where literally people told me no, we did it anyway, and they still bought it. <laughs> so, okay, so the question was, how do you filter that? In his, in his experience, they had some startups where uh, they would ask, 
point out if someone would buy the product if they built it. And they would say yes, but then they wouldn't buy it. And then you'd have the opposite of two where they'd say no, but then they actually end up buying it. You know, I don't know if that's the specific instance, I guess. Uh, the, I can tell you what some of the, the faults that we had that were kind of difficult to mitigate was in our specific case is that the person who was telling us whether or not they'd buy or not was not the, was not the actual person who would make the decision. Yeah. Right, so they'd say yes, but then they had no power to make the decision, so you know, their answer really doesn't matter. Right, so you've got to make sure that you're asking the right people. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing that, that we did. I don't know if that helps it. Okay. If you in your specific case. Yeah. I, I mean, did you see that where it, it didn't always, did you have people that said no, uh, or was it pretty universal that well, people were okay with that? Well, I mean, part of it is that is it, I mean, the best case scenario is that you actually do a pre-sale, right? Yeah. I mean, that would be the best case. Uh, but a lot of parts, that's not possible. It wasn't possible with us either. Mm -hmm. But the thing you're after is that would someone reasonable in their position that you're trying to market to and make a product for, would they buy? Yeah. Because in the end, like, other people that we met with, not all of them bought our product yet. Yeah. Uh, a good portion of them have, but not all of them. But it's other people in and it just goes off for them. Right. Uh, I have two questions. One is, is your mock up looked real nice. Did you have a designer so you put that together or did you use a specific tool to build it? Okay, the question was, is that our mock ups look half decent? And do we have a designer do that? Um, our designer was, was Brian Whitmer in PowerPoint. Okay. That's just, those are actually just PowerPoint squares. My other question is, is you know, you were approaching kind of uh, corporations. So the question was, we went to universities, so they're big entities. What if you go to small businesses and it's just like one or two guys? How do you do that? You bring them in, you go there. Um, I don't know. It just depends on your specific case. You just need to know, are you getting the data that you need out of them? Are you getting the data of what the pain points are in that market? Are you learning how they get their money, how they spend their money? You, know, you just need to get the data one way or the other. Thank you.